I'm going to read our text today from 1 John chapter 1. I'm going to start at verse 5. So follow along as I read 1 John 1, 5. I encourage you to find a, a Bible and have it with you because we're going to be jumping around a bit. And it's great to keep your eyes on the text while I'm going through. 1 John 1, 5. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie. Do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God for his word. Have you ever had this experience? And maybe I can tell you a little bit about my history, and then you can put yourself in. Uh, I was uh, coming out of high school. I was uh, just a punk. I've changed a lot. I know. Uh, just, just a punk. Just like didn't really have a lot of cares in the world. Uh, very much like see to your pants. Uh, with the last job of my high school career. I had uh, planned to go to UNB, had uh, applied there, looked good, and within the last like month, I would say two weeks, I uh, quit my job in, uh, in anger and frustration, I told the boss off and told him I was going to Bible school. That's how it worked out. God was working in my heart as I was this young punk living for self. So in the midst of that, think of this, so in the midst of that, here's this God sorting me out, kind of where I'm at in my life. Somewhere along that year, um, I, I, I meet this uh, lovely lady, this lovely girl. Her name is Kimberly Bamford. And uh, along that year, her, her sister came, uh, who was named Shelby Bamford. And, uh, you know, you ever have this experience? It's like, you know, wow, she's really interesting. But I already knew, as a young punk, and this sweet, wonderful uh, lady named Shelby Bamford, um, I already knew, untouchable, out of my league, right? You guys all agree? Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> out of my league, absolutely. Thank you, Essie. Um, so, it, in... in um, yeah, in the run of, she wasn't in Bible school at the time, she was still in high school. Uh, in the run of uh, that year and going into the next year and, uh, you know, taking notice of this, this girl, uh, you know, along the way there becomes a, a time when, when we're, uh, we're sitting around a lot together, her, her first year of Bible school when she was there. We're sitting around a lot together and I'm thinking, you know what? I think we're, um, we're kind of like moving into a relationship here. Now, I did not have great definitions of relationships. Uh, what those look like. And so my definition of having a relationship with her would be probably different, definitely different, than her definition of having a relationship. So I could say things like, yeah, 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 you know what, this, uh, this Shelby Bamford girl, we're having a relationship. And she, if she was asked, would be like, no, I'm not really interested at all, actually. Uh, he's kind of hung up on himself. Uh, you can have this conversation with her later. Uh, She'll lay it out for you. It's interesting, right? Because uh, somewhere along the line, we had to sit down and define, you ever have these conversations? Define the relationship. Or we had to sit down and have the conversations about the relationship. And come to find out, you know, to my shock and awe, we didn't have a relationship yet. She had other expectations than me just assuming we had a relationship. As we come into this text... Man, there's so much around that I could just 
go off on, and it would not be good in the end. Uh, because we come into this text, there's an issue here. There's an issue that is similar, uh, but I would say is um, it, it, it's so much greater than if you have a relationship with someone that you're just not clear on, or or you think you have a relationship with someone, and they're like, no, 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 that's not how the relationship is defined. In this text here, there are those in 1 John who believe they have a relationship with God, but it's on different terms than what God is saying they have a relationship on. So as much as it's important for me to be very clear, or for my wife now, uh, to be very clear of what our relationship was, it is much more important for us to be clear of what a relationship with God is, what that looks like. And God defines that for us. So we're going to see that as we go down through this text. What we're going to see today as we do our second uh, sermon here in 1 John, and we're calling 1 John Gospel Culture. It is a matter of how do we live the truth of the good news of Jesus or the truth of the gospel out? How does that have any effect on us as we live our life? So as we uh, begin into this focus, we're going to see, is there a test to know if we know God? Is there a test? Do you know God? Are you in a relationship with God? You might say, yeah, yeah, I'm in a relationship with God. Yeah, I, I mean, I believe there's a, there's a God or a, a, a great power out there or, or something bigger than ourselves. Are you in a relationship with God? How do you define your relationship with God? And then let me ask you this. If you define your relationship with God, is it the same as God would define it? And whose definition is more important? Brad's or Shell's? Yours or God's, and how this relationship is defined. All right, so we want to see that as we go through. Is there a test to know if we know God? There is. First John one five to two two gives us three things I think that we can look at to help us see. If we truly know God, it has, has to do with character. It has to do with find my notes here. I'll just look up here. It has to do with character, has to do with what's next? Sin has to do with. Savior. All right. Man, my notes are messed up tonight. It's going to be fun. It has to do with character, with sin, and with Savior. This is how you know if you have a relationship with God. So look at uh, verse 5. This is the message that we have heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light. In, in the very first section of 1 John, the, at the end of the first of First John, one of the big emphases that kind of overlays the whole thing is this book is so you will know if you have fellowship or relationship. In the context of fellowship, it's going to come up again in a minute. But the context of fellowship, it means life on life. Do you have a life on life with God? Are are the things that He has is that yours? How do you know that? What you have, who you are, is, is that his? How do you know that? When we talk about fellowship in the Bible, it's not just, you know, who has the best coffee, let's go there and hang out after church. It's, it's life on life. It's I share life with, and they share life with me. So as the first part of John opens up, it says the aim of the gospel is fellowship or union with God. And then it says, how do you know you have union with God? How do you know you know God? The first thing is, we have a growing realization of God's character. Do you have a growing realization of God's character? Think about John, the writer. John was one of the apostles, the youngest of the apostles. He, um, if, if you read his gospel... 
and then you read these three epistles, and you read his life as he interacts with Jesus, you, you, you begin to, and even if you read Revelation, you, you begin to recognize John is like this apostle of love. Like he mentions the love of God a lot. I mean, probably the verse you memorized first as a little kid if you were grew up in church was a John verse. Yeah? John 3, 16, for God so loved. I mean, this is, John is, is known as this apostle of love. In fact, uh, he refers to himself as the apostle, the disciple that God, that Jesus loved. And he's not like boasting. It's just that's the relationship he had with Jesus. It was intimate. It was personal. It was overflowing. He walked with God. He talked with God. He touched God. He laid his head on on Jesus' uh, chest. He saw him in an everyday way. They built fires together. They ate fish together. They probably built like shelters together. Can you, ma- can you imagine that with Jesus? You're thinking of Survivor right now. It's nothing like Survivor. Well, maybe the disciples were stuck in the drama. But, but this was like an everyday bit. He was known as one who understood or grasped the love of Jesus. In fact, uh, when, when, he, uh, when Jesus is hanging on the cross and he, he sees his mom there at, the, at, the, at his death, he turns to John and he says, you care for my mom. I mean, that's, a, that's quite an expression of love, isn't it? So when you come to 1 John, in verse 5, what do you expect John to emphasize here? What do you expect him to say? Here's the character of God, because this verse is driving us to the character of God. Do you want to know if you know God? It has something to do with the character of God. If you know God, you know his character. But John says this, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is love, right? No. So we sh- that should be odd to us if we know John. That he starts here. God is light. What is light? What does is, what is light refer to? I mean, Jesus says, John writes about it in his gospel, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And that's what John picks up. He picks up that metaphor. This is the message of light. God is light. It's a message essentially about the character of God. In fact, God is so much light, it says here, In him is no darkness at all. That's a, that's a really word, weird Greek phrase. It, it uses two negatives, and it's really hard to translate. It means, you cannot give me an example of God's darkness. He has no darkness. There is no way you can describe, if you look at the God of the Bible, as darkness. He is light. He is light, meaning he is life and not death. He is the light of true witness. He sees all, knows all. Nothing hides from him. He is the light of revelation to the world. You want a clear picture of God? You can't make him up. Christ is the light of the Father to the world, of God to the world. There is no evil behavior in God. There is openness. He sees. There is no secrecy. He knows all that you need to know. He reveals all that you need to know about him. He is truth and not falsehood. His kingdom is different than this kingdom or Satan's kingdom.
He is the light of the glory of God. Everything you need to know in regards to the holiness of God, the brightness of God, the the shining of God, the the greatness of God, the unable to be describedness of God can be can be brought into this idea of, of light. We think about the source of life. Light, light and the dark is often used for, for life and death in Scripture. Think about the source of, of life. When, when the world is still in chaos, God speaks, God makes, God creates. Ex nihilo, out of nothing God makes. He breathes life. He speaks life. You think in this passage, in 1 John, at the very beginning, he starts with the greatness of God. In Gospel of John, he starts with the greatness of God. John is, although he knows God is love, and he's going to get to that later on, he is consumed, first of all, with the greatness of who God is. His great character. We sung about it just a few minutes ago. Go to the book of Revelation where John writes. He talks about these these uh, angels that are around the, the throne of God 24-7. There's one that looks like an ox. There's one that looks like a man. There's one that looks like a lion. And they have eyes. You, sh- you should read that. You should draw it. Try to do a sketch of it. They have eyes everywhere, it says. All over them. Why? Because they are constantly captured with the greatness, the glory of God. And what do they do day and night, 24-7? What do they say? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And it never gets old. Some of you might have been singing that song going, wow, this is kind of a long song. It never gets old to them. Because God is so great. That's how John starts. You want to know if you have a relationship with God? What do you know of God's character? Not what do you believe of God's character. How do you think God should act or should be? I don't like this feeling of of God being so great and me being so small. If you don't hold the character of God as the Bible holds the character of God, it's a good indication you do not know the God of the Bible. How do you know if you know God? You know there's a growing realization of God's character. And like the angels around the throne, you never fully get it completely, okay, got God in a box. I get to know all about him. No, every detail, no problem. Don't need the Bible anymore. Don't need to talk about it anymore. Don't need to go to church anymore. Don't need to think on it. Don't need to meditate on it. Do you know God? Do you think on God? Do you have a relationship with God? How do you know that you know God? Let me ask you. Do you think about God this week? This past week? Did you consider Him? Did you sit with him? Were you awed by him? Were you like, wow, I can't believe this God made this world. I can't believe watching the little plants come up through the ground. I can't believe we're, we're breaking out of winter again and new life is coming. It's like a annual testimony the things that die, God raises us again. I can't believe this is the God I worship. Have you thought on God this week? But this is what's happening in this church. In this church that John's writing to, a lot of them have left, many of them have left the faith. A lot have left the fundamental, orthodox, theological understanding of who God is. And they've left the church, but they haven't left the area, and they're, they're rallying others around misconceptions about God, about sin. 
and about Jesus? How do you know if you truly know God? You have a growing realization of God's character. The light is shining in your life. And you're like, oh, I, you know, I never really thought of life this way. And it's a constant maturing in that because of the person of God, because of who he is, because of his character. And in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. When you realize that God's character, understanding that God is light, and then we need to walk in that light, this text says. If the message is God is light, those who claim to know him are marked by a life of walking in the light. That there is a sense that your life that you're living out is under this, I'm living out of this light that is God, this person who influences then how I walk, how I live. Three things that he points out here. Walking in the light, demonstrate it in our life, is embracing a life that is willing to be exposed to truth. Look at this. We say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness. We lie and do not practice the truth. You can't say, I know God is light, Because the knowing that we're talking about is not head knowing. It's life knowing. It's life being shaped by the God who is light. You cannot know that you know God if your life is not being shaped by the God who is light. So we are embracing, if you say you know God, you are someone who embraces being exposed to the truth. That is incredibly rare in our culture right now. Allowing the truth of God, His Word, His people, how it's worked out, lived out, allowing the truth of God to expose our life more than our own truth, for one thing more than the truth of a collective culture. Embracing a life exposed to the truth is walking with God in the light. It is no longer hiding in darkness. It's no longer coddling sin. It's no longer holding on to ideas or philosophies under the protection of our own, trying to protect our own self-rightness. It is no longer holding back from exposing our lives in truth so that we might self-gratify our life. We may find ways to self-gratify that we say, yeah, I, I know this is probably not great. And it's probably not in keeping with like an idea that God is light, sees all, knows all, expo- everything's exposed before him. But you know what? I like it. I like it. On some level, it just satisfies me. Yeah, yeah, I feel like junk afterwards, but I'm not willing to see a change in it. You know you know God when. You know God is light, your growing understanding of the character of God, and your life is beginning to demonstrate an exposure to the truth of God, who He is. You're walking in light when you show genuine fellowship with God's people. You might not put that in here. How do I know I'm walking in light? If God is light, and I am, you know, I'm concerned about exposing my life to the truth of God, isn't that enough? Isn't that just, it's complete now? I'm just going to work on that. Not according to this passage, not according to John. Look what he says is the next evidence here of walking in light because God is light. We say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness. We lie, do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have what? Fellowship 
koinonia, with one another. We have fellowship with one another. That's the next thing that John says is an evidence of walking in the light, and therefore you can know that you know God. You are in koinonia, fellowship, shared life, life on life, life together. Not isolated Christians. If you say you know God and you're an isolated Christian, John is calling you out. Be very clear here. I don't want you to be, yeah, maybe, maybe not. John is calling you out. If you live an isolated Christian life, John is calling you out. You want to know that you know God? You need to be in fellowship with those who also walk in light. If God is light, we're exposing our life to light. We then are walking together, exposing our life to light. Fellowship. We're not secluded. We're not hiding. We're not isolated. We're sharing. We're participating. We're giving to one another. We're calling each other out. We're lifting each other up. We're walking beside We're not self-sustained Christians. It's not how the bodies work. Body doesn't work by self-sustained parts. If you think I can be a self-sustained part, I would say you do not know God as you should know God. You cannot be a self-sustained part. It is repeated constantly in the New Testament. A third way of knowing if you're walking in the light is you're being purified by Christ's blood. That's what it says at the end of this verse. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You want to know if you know God? Walk in the light. Because God is light. And one of the ways you walk in the light is a constant walk in the purification of the blood of Christ. So you recognize God is light. I am not. I might think, hey, God, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. I'm, I'm not bad, you know. I, um, I mean, I'm not Putin. You know what I'm saying? I'm all right. I'm not, I'm not like way off evil. So, you know, I'm good, right, God? The passage here says I need the purification of the blood of Christ. It's only by the blood of Christ that I can stand before, I can have my evil made right before God the Father. Only because of what Christ has done. That's it. I need to place faith in what Christ has done. And therefore, I am then seen as in Christ, having been made pure, purified, Great. I'm good to go, right? You come to Christ and you're like, this is a new freedom. I know I'm right before God. I can I can cry out to him. He's with me. I confess my sins. I feel like, oh yeah. And then after what? A week, two weeks, maybe three months, you can start looking around your life and you're like, oh man. This is just not what it should be, I don't think. What, what The attitudes I'm holding right here, the unforgiveness, the anger, the, the habits, the priorities, these, these are just not right. I mean, I'm supposed to be a child of God because I'm purified in Christ. Christ has died for me. My sins are forgiven. And they look around and go, oh, wow, I'm not, I'm not really living that way, am I? What do I need in that moment? I, just, I need to work harder, Right? I need to clean up my act. I need to pull the stuff out of the closet. Is that what I need to do? What will purify me? The blood of Christ. I need still the blood of Christ. Let's say as I'm walking my spiritual life out, recognizing who God is, I'm, I'm beginning to see some of that some of those habits change my attitudes, my heart, my intentions towards others. They're starting to change. They're starting to transform. 
But then I realize as I'm walking, I have these weights that are sins. These, these wrongs, these habits that, that feel like weights when I'm trying to run my Christian life. It's the same habit or the same attitude or the same sin. Yeah, yeah I'm dealing with my attitudes. I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with my, my kind of general outlook on life. I see some transformation. But these same weights that so easily beset me are still hanging on. How will I ever be set free? How will I ever be forgiven? How will I ever not live under the weight of the guilt of that sin? What do I need in that moment? The only way I can be purified is what? The blood of Christ. Here's my point. You and I forever will need to be purified by the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That is a growing understanding of walking in the light. Where do you run to first when you feel you need forgiveness? Where do you run to first when you feel your relationship with each other is not right? Run here first. Go first to God. Ask Him to purify you in the blood of Jesus Christ. Allow that to change your thinking so you can live it this way. You want to know for sure that you know God? You've got to get a hold of God's character. You've got to know that He is light and you've got to live that light out. You need also a growing re realization of sin. I've been, said sin quite a bit already in this sermon. Look at verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. There's two pushbacks that come out here. So, so uh, you can hear me talking about um, needing to be made right, need to be walked in the light, and you can be like, ah, the whole sin thing. Now, I, I like the idea of uh, bettering myself, coming to Jesus, having my like my wrongs cleaned up. But this whole thing of like calling it sin, you. Why, why, why would I want to call the things I do wrong sin? Why, why can't they just be like? Normal failings. And there is things that, such thing as normal failings that are not sin. But John is addressing sin. Two pushbacks on this sin thing. One is verse 8. Sin. If we say, and John is using an argument, because, I mean, what other reason would you say if we say? Like, for instance, if, um, if you and I have an argument and we don't get along um, and I uh, talk to my wife about it or someone else about it and I say, he said this and I said that, why would I be saying I said that and he said this? Because hopefully that's how it went down. Why is John saying, if you say, right here? He's not making up like a fictitious story. This is what's happening in his church, or in this church. There are those in the church who are saying, sin, ew! No, 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 no. When I came to Jesus, he purified me of my sin, and I don't really need to acknowledge sin anymore. Sin is passe. It's gone. I don't ever have to really deal with it. It's gone. I, that's what's going on in the church. Sin, ew, no. We, you came to Jesus, right? But you live on a higher plane now. You don't really have to deal with your sin. If you want to know that you know God, you need to deal with your sin. That's what John's saying. We have to realize 
We have to have a growing understanding of our sin. There's been a promoting of a higher spiritual knowledge in this church where they say they no longer would really struggle with sin. They don't look, I don't look at myself as a sinner, I look at myself as a saint. So sin doesn't touch me anymore. It's not really a part of my my everyday reality. I don't really have to deal with it. It's a reminder, right, of the old Spurgeon story. When there was this was going on in Spurgeon's day, a group of pastors had gotten together, and they were talking about this one night. And one of the guys, one of the pastors, said, "Yeah, yeah, that's me. I I have reached a level where where sin doesn't really affect me anymore. I am walking on a sinless cloud. I hope you guys get there someday." The next morning, the story is the next morning, they're all around for breakfast, and Spurgeon brings out uh, a big pitcher of milk and pours it over this guy's head just out of the blue. And the guy freaks out and yells at Spurgeon. And Spurgeon goes, aha, there it is. You're not sinless. Your sin was just asleep. It needed to be woken up. I'm not advocating that. (laughs) But if we believe that we don't have to acknowledge our sin anymore, it's a false gospel. It's a, I'm living out of my own truth idea. It's not allowing God to examine the areas of our lives that are not being brought into the light. Look at verse 9. If we confess our sins, so if we say we have no sin, we deceive deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So when I first come to Christ, I come to confess my sins, and so what you're telling me is the blood of Jesus Christ covers my sins, and I receive... Forgiveness? I feel receive a release from guilt in that moment. Here's why you and I need to acknowledge our sins. You know what happens when you acknowledge your sin? You are brought to Christ. What greater joy could there be? You, you hide your sin, you push it away, you call it, it isn't really a sin, it's just me, I'm on a grumpy day. The way we lash out, the way we're short with each other, we're angry, we overflow onto other people. That's not really, I'm not acknowledging that as sin. Well, if you don't acknowledge it as sin, you don't need a Savior. You don't need Jesus. You get to try to work that out in your own bundle of frustration. We have a growing realization of sin in our lives. We're acknowledging it. Look at verse 10. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Verse 9, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We're made right with Him again. If we have not sinned, So in the first instance, if we say we haven't sinned, the text says, you're a liar. You're just lying. You're lying to yourself. In the second second incident, it's not a matter of you're not acknowledging sin. It's that you're not accepting sin. It's like, no, I, I I don't sin. When you say you don't sin, then you stand on your own righteousness. You stand on your own goodness. You stand on your own self-made holiness. And when you do that, you make God a liar. The first incident, you demonstrate you're a liar because you're not accepting that you sin. The second incident, you're making God a liar. Do you want to know if you know God If you know God, you'll have a growing understanding of His character. You'll have a growing realization of your sin and where to go 
with your sin. And that's the last thing. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. Listen to the tone of this. He's brought us to this. He's brought us to this. God is, is light. Let that soak in. Change how you live. If that's going to change how you live, you're going to look at your sin. But you can go to Christ with your sin. He will, he will forgive your sin. He's faithful and just to forgive you your sin. God is faithful to His character, to His justice. That's what He's faithful to. So He's faithful to forgive your sins. And then He says, my little children. You might be like, why are you calling me little children, John? You're so condescending. You know, this is an old disciple talking in deep concern and love to the church. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. I'm writing these things to you so that you will not be marked by sin. So you not live in sin. So you not dwell in sin. That's what I'm writing these things to you for. If you know that you know God and who He is, His character, a growing realization of the seriousness of sin, if you know that, I'm writing you this so you don't stay there. So you don't live in sin. That's what I'm writing to you for. You're not owned by it. What in the world could help you know that you're not owned by it? If anyone does sin, or it should say, when you sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. There's a growing realization of the need of a Savior. If you know that you know God, there will be a growing realization of the need of the Savior even greater than when you knew you needed Him for that moment of salvation to be made right with the Father. It will be a growing realization that I still need a Savior. Still need Him. He still needs to be my delight. His work still needs to be my joy. His life still needs to be my hope. You know what? One of the things that often happens in our lives as we grow, mature, when we're young, we don't, we, even as believers, we've come to Christ, we, we, we recognize, we appreciate to some level the work of Jesus in saving us. But then we go about our lives. And we, we kind of live as if, um, often, as if we're kind of untouchable in regards to what happens after this life. In our culture, in our day and age right now, we, we hide death. Death gets hid. All the time. I mean, I, I think my kids are probably odd because they've actually been to uh, several funerals where there was like the body of the loved one laying out. That's an odd thing in our culture. Because we don't want to touch death. We don't want to see death. We, don't, we like to hide behind Comfort. But there is a reality that that death brings us to. It brings us to this need for a Savior. This need for, this is a temporary life, but there is an eternal life. We have a growing realization of our need for a Savior. It means this. It means we have a growing realization that Christ is our only righteous advocate. That's what this text says. That our only righteous advocate is Christ. The word here for advocate is is a pericolite. It's a a word that is used only uh, four or five times in the Scriptures in the New Testament. Guess who uses it? John, right. John uses it. He writes about the paraclete. This is the only place Christ is called the paraclete. The one who comes alongside of. The one who advocates for. Every other time, it's the Holy Spirit. 
who's called the one who comforts, the one who advocates for, the one who comes alongside of, the one who gives the Christian what they need. Here Jesus is called that. He is called that because he is the righteous representation of us before God and God before us. He advocates for us. Advocating isn't, this isn't just simply, and oftentimes we think of it this way, this isn't simply a, um, a lawyer word. Have you ever had to take your kid to the hospital? You're trying to like have a conversation with the doctor about what's going on with your kid. It's one of the most gut-wrenching experiences as a parent, especially if the kid can't talk. The kid is, you know, not at that place in their life where they can talk yet. Have you ever had to try to advocate for your child? That's this picture. It isn't just a, well, you know, I'm, a, I'm their parent, and therefore I'm their, their lawyer. No, it's like a compassionate love. I stand in their stead kind of sense. That's what this picture is. If you know that you know God, you will have a growing understanding of, of Jesus as your righteous advocate. You will have a growing understanding. You do not have what it takes in and of yourself to stand before God. You must run to Jesus. You'll have that deepening understanding. It will affect how you walk your life out. Verse 2 Not only will we see him as a righteous advocate, but he is the propitiation for our sins. Not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Meaning, we will have a growing understanding of Christ as our atoning sacrifice. Atoning sacrifice takes both the wrath of God and gives us the forgiveness and the Guilt-free. Guilt-freeness that's offered through the sacrifice. This is Jesus. Want to know that you know God? Where are you with God's character? Do you think about Him this week? I mean, not just as a passing. Not just as part of like a, I had a devotional about God. Is your mind saturated with the person of God? His plans, His intentions, His work. Does His character drive your priorities? Uh, uh, Let me be really clear. If that is not you, you need to stop and say, do I really know God? Do you have a, a growing understanding of His character? Do you have a growing understanding of your sin? Or sin is not, you know, that's not really something that I deal with or agree I have. Or it's just, you know, I, I just go about my life and Jesus is good. He'll forgive me someday. Do you have a growing reality of your sin? If you know God, you can know that you know him because you have a growing understanding of the offense of sin before God. And the need for a Savior. You have a growing understanding of Jesus as your advocate and the sacrificial atonement that he has made on your behalf. If you answer yes to all three of those, it's a good test of the fact that you know God. If you answer no to some of those, this is a good week. As you move towards Easter, to pause and to say, who is God What is sin? Why do I need a Savior? Ask yourself those three questions. All right, we're going to stop there. Thank you for your patience. We're going to uh, to move to confession. Pete, you want to come up and uh, help us lead to confession? Pete's going to pray us to confession. We're not going to do comments and questions today. We'll uh, pick those up again over the next couple weeks. I just don't want it to go any longer, so.
Pete's going to come and lead us into confession. Confession time is uh, understanding what you have just heard. How will you then allow the Spirit of God to speak into your life? To bring you to Himself? What do you need to confess? If you see who God is, how do you confess? What are the things that you say, I, this needs to be made right with God? Or you need to confess who God is. God, you are. That will reorient you as you move into uh, continual responses of worship. Pete, you're going to have to speak really loud. Can you do that? I think so. Okay. Pete's going to lead us into confession. Come do that, Pete. Um, as you were listening, um, for those of you who are a Christian, the Holy Spirit might have been prodding you in areas where you have felt conviction. Um, it's not a time to, as Brad mentioned, hide behind the comfort of excuses or hiding behind it. It's God's kindness to you to bring to mind where you need to confess. So confession is a gift given to us. So I'm going to give you a couple of moments here to um, freely in your own heart and mind confess your sin to God that he's brought to your mind for your sake, for his glory, and then I'll wrap us up in a prayer of confession. Father God, we uh, confess that we don't know you as well as you have revealed yourself to us. We confess that there's sin we want to avoid. And Father, we confess that we need a Savior. Holy Spirit, would you continue through this week as we reflect on the Father's character, Jesus' character, continue to bring our sin before us so that we, as we have heard, just heard in your word, might look into that mirror and not walk away. Thank you for the gift of confession. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.